Over 600 years ago, around the turn of the 15th century, China, under the control of the Ming Empire, built itself one of the greatest naval forces the world had ever seen. Manned by 27,000 men, this fleet was used for overseas expeditions rather than military conquest, and consisted of 317 vessels, including some of which were 400 feet long. Besides being able to build trade and political relations, from Calcutta in India to the east coast of Africa and the Persian Gulf, with this naval power, China had the potential to discover the American continent almost a century before Columbus sailed west in the Santa Maria. However, in the mid-1400s, a change in political power led to a series of laws severely limiting sea exploration, eventually banning ships with more than two masts. China gave up its power overseas and lost the opportunity to challenge Europeans for control of territories across the globe. The treasure fleet of the Ming was first commissioned by the third emperor of the Ming dynasty, who came to power in 1402 after overthrowing his scholarly nephew, and named himself Yongle, meaning eternal joy. The Yongle emperor began his reign by granting unprecedented power to the castrated palace servants, called eunuchs, who had helped him overthrow the previous emperor. This included appointing his longtime personal servant and friend, the Muslim eunuch Zhang Ha, as commander-in-chief of a new imperial convoy, an extravagant fleet that would have surpassed European maritime capabilities for centuries to come. The building of this fleet was one of the most significant achievements of the Yongle Emperor's rule. Massive amounts of China's resources went into the construction of hundreds of trading ships, warships, and support vessels, which were sent on seven expeditions throughout the China Seas and Indian Ocean. The purpose of these journeys was most likely to replenish the imperial treasury with foreign trade, announce the rule of the Yongle Emperor, and dispel rumors that the former and supposedly dead emperor was living and hiding. In 1405, 317 ships departed from the shores of China with their eyes set on Calicut, India. They were drawn to the trade offered by this city one of the most successful in Southern Asia. A second journey to India was arranged upon their successful return to celebrate the inauguration of Calicut's new king and the newfound goodwill between China and India. On the third expedition, Zheng Ha led the treasure fleets down the coast of China to Malacca, a new city between India and the islands of Indonesia, where they set up a tablet officially recognizing Malacca as an independent country. In 1414, the fleet traveled even farther to a rich Arabian port at the opening of the Persian Gulf. The Yongle Emperor may have wanted to use the precious metals and stones found here in the construction of his new palace in the Forbidden City. Zheng Ha brought back many foreign envoys who introduced many new animals such as zebras, giraffes, and the oryx to China. On his fifth journey, Zheng Ha made many stops along the Indian coast before arriving on the southern end of Arabia. Here, the fleets traded for many precious items and were once again given animals they had never seen before, llamas, leopards, and ostriches. The next expedition went on to Africa. Not much is known about this sixth journey, except that little trade occurred, and it was sent home early to enjoy the festivities of the completed Forbidden City. However, it may be that this expedition was driven more by exploration than the desire for profit, and suggested China was becoming curious about distant lands. The Yongle Emperor died in 1424 from a series of strokes, and, ten years later, the seventh voyage of the treasure fleet was sent out by his grandson and successor, the Shuanda Emperor. On its final voyage, the treasure fleet returned to many important ports from previous expeditions. Smaller fleets traveled down the African coast as far south as Malindi in present-day Kenya. On the return journey to China, Zheng Ha died at the age of 62. A life at sea ended at sea. Two years later, the Swanda Emperor died unexpectedly, and his grandfather's great fleet slowly died with him. By 1500, it was a capital offense to build a boat with more than two masts. 
1525, an imperial edict declared all ships that were able to travel on the ocean should be destroyed. Finally, in 1551, it became illegal to travel at sea on a ship with multiple masts. Within a century, the Chinese demolished their own naval power and moved from a period of social and technological expansion to a policy of isolation, a self-destructive turning point caused by political tensions and economic dilemmas that arose when China was left without a strong central ruler. Both the Yangle and Xuanda emperors had believed in expanding China's influence and reaching out to foreign countries. However, the Zhangtong emperor, Senate successor of Xuanda, came to power when he was only seven years old, and the direction of the Ming government fell to the rivaling voices of the eunuchs and Confucian officials. Focused on holding on to the past, the Confucians wanted China to be completely independent of all other nations, distrusted private capital, and saw all overseas expeditions as wasteful. Also, the continued involvement of eunuchs in foreign trade led to official edicts limiting the size of ships and possibilities for overseas commerce, as the Confucian officials worked to impede their rivals. Chinese scholar Lo Zhongpeng once said, tribute trade worked for the court as long as it kept its monopoly on foreign trade and forced foreign countries to accept low prices and payment in paper currency. So when sudden inflation destroyed the face value of China's paper money, overseas commerce became even less appealing. Furthermore, the general extreme expense of the expeditions was another major factor that led to their eventual demise especially since floods and corruption had destroyed much of the government's tax base, and the money they did have was needed to address the growing Mongol threat in the north. Unfortunately for them, China had none of the motives that eventually led Europeans to expand and control the New World. In Europe, although sea exploration was initiated by the government, it was the aggressive ambition of private merchants and companies interested in personal profit that led countries such as France, Portugal, Spain, and England to expand and colonize by sea. The general coastal location of these countries and the fierce competition between European nations for control of land and resources also drove maritime exploration. In China, Confucian policies of isolation left them uninterested in building colonies. And because the Ming Dynasty was one of the wealthiest civilizations of its time, overseas exploration provided far more economic opportunities for the Europeans than the Chinese. If China had been motivated to explore and conquer foreign territories, the world today could look very different. Columbus crossed the Atlantic with three ships. Zheng He's largest fleet was over 100 times that size. The Santa Maria was 90 feet long one-fourth the length of the great treasure ships. Finally, Columbus's crew would have been outnumbered 300 to 1 by Zhang He's. Overall, China's naval technology far surpassed that of the Europeans at the beginning of the 15th century, but they lost their edge over the West as their interest in maritime travel dwindled. The significance of the turning point in this case wasn't what happened, but what didn't happen. We can only imagine how history would have been altered if China had taken advantage of the opportunities presented by the great naval power it had created for itself. Maybe we would be speaking Chinese today. Maybe the United States would never have existed. However, in the words of New York Times reporter Nicholas Kristof, in the end, an explorer makes history but does not necessarily change it for his impact depends less on the trail he blazes than on the willingness of others to follow.